Germany is taking steps to reopen the economy and further ease restrictions on public life. Germany may have recorded its first locally transmitted case of COVID-19 earlier than Italy, but its death rate is significantly lower. The number of deaths in Germany has remained low. In the summer of 2020, Germany was being hailed as a model for the how to handle the coronavirus pandemic. It had comparatively low infection and mortality rates and a government that appeared to be quick to act. It introduced a contact tracing app that seemed both popular and privacy friendly. But the picture changed as the second wave set in. Both the government and its contact tracing app came under scrutiny. In an effort to save face, the government got behind a new app. But with its additional features came fresh concerns about privacy and security. The human rights situation is worsening globally, and that is why it's important that we hold all those accountable that violate human rights. Islam is the real problem that we face in the Netherlands, in France, in Belgium, in all of Europe. The independence of the judges in Hungary is one of the best in the European Union. <laughs> we need the tripod of democracy, respect for human rights, and respect for the rule of law. Welcome to the Speech Bag Podcast by Liberties, where we explore human rights and democracy issues across the EU. I'm Jonathan Day. In this episode, we look at the story of Germany's two coronavirus contact tracing apps. There are surprising lessons to be taken from the work that went into giving Germany its tools to see out the pandemic. But do the solutions it's come up with keep our privacy and data secure? Liebe Mitbürgerinnen und Mitbürger, seit Dienstag haben wir ein neues, wichtiges Werkzeug im Kampf gegen die Pandemie, die Corona-Warn-App des Robert-Koch-Instituts. Ich freue mich sehr darüber, dass schon in dieser ersten Woche... That's German Chancellor Angela Merkel in June 2020. She's promoting the country's government-backed contact tracing app, the corona Warn app or CWA. Its development was a microcosm for the perceived struggle to balance effectiveness and people's rights like privacy and data protection. When the plan for their contact tracing app was first conceived, the government was inclined to oblige telecoms companies to share users' GPS data as a means to track cases and contacts. There was some uh, early moments when it seemed to be possible uh, that it will be GPS data then the government could basically see uh, where people go um, on a massive scale. So, I mean, if it's a non-mandatory app, then not everyone's movements, but if it's a mandatory app, then basically uh, the government would have had data on each of us's daily movements. Orshi Reich is a senior advocacy officer at the Civil Liberties Union for Europe, or Liberties. She's been monitoring the development and implementation of COVID-19 contact tracing apps across the EU. And she says that pushback, especially from human and digital rights groups, moved the government away from this idea. Its solution, what became the Corona Warn app, uses Bluetooth low energy technology instead of GPS. But an early model of it still intended to have a centralized system in place where people's data was stored on a central server. Yet again, there was pushback. More than 300 academics and organizations penned open letters urging for a decentralized system. It was a great example of civil society engagement, and it was a successful one. WA is a decentralized system. It means that uh, basically it collects Bluetooth data, Bluetooth-based data on whom you have met during the uh, day or whom who was in your close vicinity uh, and, and during your day. And that data doesn't leave your phone. Google and Apple, which make running the mobile apps possible, gave a big push to the decentralized cause when they said they would only host apps that used a decentralized system. Human and digital rights groups were generally supportive of the CWA, and so was the public. So I think actually everyone was very enthusiastic about CWA at first. Uh, the government saw it as sort of a panacea that we will be able to stop the next wave of the pandemic. And then people were like very enthusiastic that, okay, so it's awesome. Now we have this technical solution we haven't had before. And our phones actually can help us to stop the pandemic. Uh, 
so it seemed to be the case that, okay, so now we are getting back some of our freedoms we didn't have in the first wave, but we will have this app on our phones and that will make it such that basically the new cases will be found in time and there will be possibly no second wave after the summer. Well, that didn't really happen. As summer turned to fall and people gradually moved indoors, infection rates climbed. A new wave laid bare an important shortcoming with the Corona Warn app. It didn't have a cluster recognition function. So yeah, what is cluster recognition about? Um, the need for a cluster recognition feature mainly followed from um, many scientific studies um, from virologists and, and infectiologists um, who discovered or the studies discovered that the main contributing factor of the pandemic spread was not necessarily only um, individual infection chains, but more super spreader events. So events where a lot of people gather at a central location and one person spreads the virus to a lot of persons. That's Christian Tunis, a digital rights consultant and the author of a new report titled COVID-19 Contact Tracing Apps in the EU, Lessons from Germany. He says that the missing cluster recognition function meant that the app was ineffective against one of the main drivers of the pandemic, especially in colder months. And the government was fully aware. These scientific studies were already published throughout the summer of 2020. And by September, October, there were a lot of IT experts calling for uh, the CWA developers to uh, implement this function. But it wasn't until spring of 2021 that the Corona Warn app was upgraded to include these functions. Why? Why did it take so long? It's not as though it was groundbreaking technology. So I've talked to a couple of experts and asked them this exact same question, and they basically said, there's no technical or legal reason for it. They could have just done it. It's not rocket science. It wouldn't have been very expensive. The authorities, the institutions just weren't up for the job. There was no, um, there was no task force around which uh, was in charge of monitoring the app and implementing, constantly implementing new features. Or if there was a task force, it wasn't working properly. Um, so it just seemed like the government didn't really do a good job of making sure that the app was uh, updated regularly with new features. As cases rose, the public lost enthusiasm for the app. It was seen as ineffective and disregarded by many. People sort of forgot about the app, didn't care to update it, pointed fingers at data protection standards. And so I think they sort of dug their own grave or dug, dug the CWA's grave. And Orshi Reich says the public sentiment was pushed by a certain dominant narrative from the media. So when it turned out that the CWA cannot uh, stop the next wave from coming, the voices uh, in the media suggesting that the whole reason or that, that we are not successful in fighting the pandemic is that uh, this Corona Warn app is privacy-minded, and with a privacy-minded app, we just cannot uh, stop the pandemic. Um, so these, these voices became very strong, uh, and um, politicians sort of abandoned the app uh because they wanted to save their political face they started looking for a new answer instead of pushing for upgrades and improvements to the cwa something that should have been done months before they started to get behind an entirely new app but not one that they would oversee rather it would be developed by a private company nexenio which developed what became the luca app luca offered something the corona warn app didn't event registration and cluster recognition. Up until then, restaurants and other places where people gathered kept guest data the old-fashioned way. So why we needed Luca uh, is that uh, at some point it became, again, possible to visit public spaces. You could go to shop, you could go to restaurants, or at least uh, like um, up the outside uh, parts of the restaurants. And... Um, how it was done uh, first is that uh, restaurant owners collected the data of the guests on paper. So they had just a slip of paper and then you as a guest needed to put there your name, 
your telephone number and your address. That wasn't an efficient system for businesses, and it wasn't a secure system for people, and its more sordid side effects were also noted. So there were uh, like social media uh, reports on how certain uh, workers at the restaurant started to harass women. And it's very easy. I mean, you just have a slip of paper. Everyone can read the data on that slip of paper. You see who writes his, her name and address and telephone number and that paper. You can just make a photo of it and start to call that woman. So the glaring flaw with the CWA, its inability to handle event registration and cluster recognition, fed a system that undermined people's privacy. Luca promised to change all that. So what happens now with the Luca is that uh, people just go there, uh, read a QR code uh, with their phones, and then the data will go to the Luca server uh, with all sorts of encryption. So actually, at least this is what the Luca uh, team says. The Luca people cannot read that data, and the restaurants for sure don't have access to that data. Luca got big endorsements from politicians and local governments, and even celebrities. They were very savvy with their promotional work. The famous German rapper spearheaded the efforts. He, he was present in German uh, talk shows. So geht's. Ihr macht Check-ins. Mit Freunden, bei Familientreffen, im Büro. Und später auch in Restaurants, Kinos, Museen oder bei Konzerten. Bei einem Infektionsfall könnt ihr alle eure Check-ins blitzschnell ans Gesundheitsamt schicken. Und das informiert sofort alle, die mit euch Kontakt hatten. That's Zmudo, the aforementioned famous German rapper, in a promotion for the app. So they, did, they had sort of this, this celebrity factor to it. And I think the other thing was that they came in at exactly the right moment. Um, people were just desperate. They wanted to have some sort of technical uh, wonder solution, miracle solution, um, to contain the pandemic during, during the early months of 2021. Luca's value was clear. It did indeed fill a need that existed at the time. But in some important ways, the launch of Luca was far different from CWA's release. For the CWA, um, many standards that are commonly raised when these sorts of um, tech responses are launched were uh, upheld. Um, most importantly, that they chose to opt for an open source solution. They released the source code immediately so that independent experts could review it. Um, they were also open to public debate. At first, they wanted to go, go for a centralized uh, standard, then go, went for a decentralized standard. For Luca, it was different. At first, they didn't want to release the source code. Then, after intense public pressure, they relented and released a source code, but that source code, code couldn't really be openly discussed because of um, copyright law, um, because they used copyright licenses, which made it almost impossible to properly discuss it. And only then, after intense public criticism, they finally released it. Um, same thing for um, um, security um, gaps. I talked to several IT experts and they, and, they, and they reported the same thing, which is that when you try to point out Lucas' flaws, the developers denied it and um, talked about how it was only a, a smear campaign and they just didn't seem to be really open to criticism and to have sort of a cooperative production um, or, or development of the app. But it wasn't just how the app was released. The biggest issue with Luca may be in how it's structured and operates. The, the system itself, I mean, the first aspect comes from, from the central difference between the Corona Van app and Luca, which is decentralized versus centralized systems. Um, centralized systems are not evil per se. It is, it, it's just very natural. You don't have to be an IT expert. When you have a giant pile of personal data, which are very valuable, stored at a central location, it's just much more vulnerable for um, security breaches. It's for, um, for both security authorities and for hackers and criminals. It's just a data treasure that's just lying around, people's personal data and also potentially location data, which restaurants they checked into when, 
um, commercial data. It's just in incredibly valuable. And so if you create a central database like that, you should have a good reason for that. And you have to, that's data protection law, the principle of proportionality and data minimization. You have to have a good reason why you prefer this central, vulnerable, dangerous system over a decentralized system. This was compounded by Nexenio's seemingly lax approach to data security. There were concerns that it had even exposed health authorities' system to potentially massive hacking attacks. When you start Luca, you have to register with your personal data. So normally I would say Christian Tönnis. But if I'm proficient with, I, uh, with if, if I know how to program codes, I can program a little macro code into it. And this code is then, um, when, it's, when, when this file is opened by Excel, Microsoft Excel, a ma then a macro code, it can be executed. And if, I'm, if, I'm, if I have evil intentions, then I can use this code to install Trojan horse software and inf infiltrate the system that uh, executes this code. Um, this is a very common um, IT hazard, which is why most... Um, most app developers who offer this sort of a registration disable the, um, the use of special um, characters so that these sorts of macro codes can't be programmed at all and the systems executing um, or, or opening these files aren't in risk of uh, executing codes um, and having the systems infiltrated. Luca didn't do that. So uh, independent IT experts demonstrated how they could use these codes to infiltrate systems. And that could have uh, put the entire health authorities IT system infrastructure in danger because they open these Excel files uh, or they open these, uh, these files with their Excel program. And if they ignore a security prompt and press uh, OK, then the entire system could be hacked. All data could be extracted from health authority servers. And so this flaw was pointed out to Luca. Um, and at first they ignored it. They didn't want to uh, disable this functionality. And all these, um, so there were a lot of IT problems and IT security problems, which is why um, um, many health authorities have um, disconnected Luca from their SORMA software, from, so from their um, from, from their um, intersection, IT intersection to their um, health IT solution. So yeah, a lot of IT security problems with Luca. Nexenio was also dogged by complaints over transparency. Luca app's development was far from what we as a digital and human rights organization take to be ideal. Or she Reich. Uh, they didn't publish uh, the, their source code. Uh, we didn't get hold of, I mean, the human rights community didn't get hold of the data protection impact assessment. Uh, so, and then they were really not forthcoming um, when it came to, to civil society's request to get to know what is really going on with the Luca app. Finally, Luca placed an added burden on health authorities. The way it operated stretched their capacity, and it could also delay delivery of critical information needed to act on possible exposures in time. While the CWA uh, warns uh, exposed contacts immediately without any central authority having to intervene, uh, Luca is, depends on health authorities triggering these warnings centrally. Um, and the first reason why that's, that could be problematic is that when um, the pandemic, when, when infection rates are really, really high, then, um, then health authorities are just completely overstretched. I mean, they, they just aren't capable of, of really following the dynamic of, of the pandemic spread. And so having these warnings um, be dependent on the health authority acting uh, in time, um, of course, exposes the entire, uh, inf um, the entire system to, uh, to risk. Um, there have been numerous reports of people being warned way too late, only a week or so after the potential uh, um, um, risk contact, which is, of course, way too late. Um, when a week has passed, they can have uh, handed on the virus to many other people. Luca also provides far more information to health authorities than they need. This means that it takes and stores more user data than is necessary. And for health authorities already awash in data, it can be too much. 
these the sorts of data that Luca offers to health authorities don't really seem to be very useful or relevant for their work at all. There have been several um, media outlets launching requests to a lot of health authorities, I think 400 of them. And the vast majority of them, um, I think it was Spiegel, uh, Netpolitik also did something similar. And the vast majority of the health authorities replied, we don't really work with these data. We, we usually do it through telephone or we, we have other means of you doing it. Um, first, so the data aren't very useful. And secondly, even if the health authorities wanted to access these data in order to use them, quite often the system just didn't work. So there were reports by numerous um, municipal health authorities, I think from Weimar, for example, um, and they said that, well, when we tried to do it, the interface didn't work. Um, and also, it's as I said, it's not connected to the central IT solution they use, which is SORMAS, S-O-R-M-A-S. Um, so even if the data were of use to them, it's not even certain that they would gain access to them in an efficient way. Clearly, Luca has its fair share of criticisms. And with the Corona Warn app now featuring event registration and cluster recognition functions, questions are being asked about the need and speed that went into Luca and the money. German states have paid out more than 20 million euros to license and use the Luca app. But if given the proper attention at the necessary time, the CWA could have long before been functioning as the Luca app does now. So what can other countries learn from Germany's development of two apps? There are many lessons, but perhaps the first is the system itself. So use decentralized solutions when possible, um, because there is no inherent reason why centralized solutions are better and they are much more dangerous, much more expensive to uh, maintain. Um, and then when you have the app, don't pretend like it's a miracle solution to everything. It's one tool among many, and it has to be embedded in a um, reasonable containment strategy and manage expectations, because otherwise it will backfire and create frustration. Uh, and then when you have the app, explain it properly. Don't pretend like, one, it's, uh, it's, it's a miracle solution, and secondly, convey to the people, because decentralized systems and anonymized systems are more sophisticated, more difficult to understand than like the centralized hammer that you sort of hit on the, on, on the pandemic spread. Explain it properly and monitor it. I think that was the most significant mistake. Um, provide updates when there's new research uh, suggesting new functionalities which can be implemented without any risks, do it. Other important lessons are to be open and transparent and to be forthright and engaging with civil society. The positive developments of the Corona Warn app were aided by the insight and expertise of civil society groups. Gain public trust by being transparent, by releasing the source code, being open to criticism, um, um, engaging civil society because it is vital. They can find uh, problems that you can't possibly find as a central entity. So how is Germany positioned to see out the pandemic? Contact tracing apps are still an important tool. And clearly there's good reason to have a little more faith in Corona Warn app, but it needs to be trusted and used. And that's on the government as much as the people. Even today, some German federal states are providing a legal basis for only the Luca app to operate. A very specific um, hurdle that still exists to using the, the CWA efficiently in places like schools and so forth are the legal basis that currently exists and the infection protection measures currently in, in, uh, in, in uh, that are currently in place in German federated states. Uh, they some of them still uh, provide that there must be a centralized solution. So only Luca, if you want to digitize the process, I think. Um, one very specific thing um, German Bundesländer could do right now is to change the infection protection measures to allow for the use of the CWA instead of LUCA. The situation is perplexing. A more privacy-friendly and at least equally effective app is available. Why not let people use it? That's a really good question. I mean, the, I mean, the Corona One apps uh, cluster recognition feature has been around for almost half a year now. Oh no, not quite, five months, four months since, since April. And uh, still many federal states haven't changed their legal basis. And the German um, Data Protection Commissioner, uh, Ulrich Kerber, has called on the federated states to change their legal basis since this feature was released. He said, hey, there's a, there's a solution that is more data protection uh, friendly. Um, 
it probably works better, uh, why don't you provide for the legal basis to use it? Um, and they just didn't react. Most of them didn't react. I talked to legal experts, policy experts, why they didn't do so. And they were also puzzled. And probably there's no, there's no real rational reason for it. That's it for this episode of the Speech Bag Podcast by Liberties, a presentation of the Civil Liberties Union for Europe. Do you have a story about using a contact tracing app or other tips or comments for the show? Send them along to podcast at liberties.eu. And to stay in the loop about all the latest human rights news and events, become a subscriber at www.liberties.eu.